webinar dedicated to e-commerce of the Consultative Committee of the Universal Postal Union. My name is Walter Trezek. I'm the host uh, today and I'm also the moderator. I am here in my capacity as the chair of the Consultative Committee. This is the second webinar and today our topic is how have e-shopper behaviors changed in the context of COVID-19? <clears throat> we have good an hour to discuss this topic and I'm very pleased uh, to announce our distinguished panelists and our keynote speaker. The COVID-19 pandemic has forever changed online shopping behaviors in both emerging and developed economies. Making eShoppers online experience a safe journey is an institutional obligation that comes with many responsibilities to ensure that consumers are protected while online. Please, um, if you have any questions, uh, if you have any comments, use the chat um, for posting your questions. I will take the opportunity then to give you the floor um, or pick up your questions accordingly. With that, uh, I would like to come to our speakers. And the first one is our keynote speaker. It is Torbjörn Frederiksson. He is the chief of the ICT policy section at the UN Conference on Trade and Development, short UNCTAD. Before joining UNCTAD, he held po positions at the Invest in Sweden agency and the Swedish Ministry of Industry and Commerce. He has a master's in international economics from the Stockholm School of Economics. With that, I would like to start uh, an introduction video and therefore I will share my screen. Um, and would like to enter right into this video. I hope you see my screen now and I will start the video. Welcome to the COVID-19 and e-commerce global review. Discover the key findings from the study conducted by UNCTAD and e trade for all partners on the impacts of COVID-19 on e-commerce and digital trade. E-commerce has been playing a growing role as part of the wider digital economy and global economic activity for the past decade. It also provides new ways of facilitating the sustainable development goals, bringing both new challenges and new opportunities. In fact, despite the global recession, the pandemic has led to a further acceleration of digital transformation. First, Let's look more closely at the global economic impact of the pandemic. The global economy shrank in 2020 by an estimated 4.3%, over two and a half times more than during the 2008 to 2009 global financial crisis. International trade, including intercontinental and intra-regional e-commerce has been negatively affected by the pandemic. UNCTAD's latest estimates suggest that global trading goods fell by some 9% in 2020 and trading services by 15%. However, as social distancing and restrictions on movement became the new normal, many businesses and consumers went digital, providing and purchasing more goods and services online. As a result, the pandemic has led to a further acceleration of digital transformation. The share of e-commerce in global retail trade is estimated to have surged from 14% in 2019 to about 17% in 2020. Further acceleration of digital transformation was also observed in other sectors such as teleworking, gaming, distance learning, digital entertainment, online conferencing. The pandemic has also benefited the world's leading digital platforms most solutions being used for e-commerce, teleworking, and cloud computing are provided by a relatively small number of large companies based mainly in China and the United States. Consumers in emerging economies have made the greatest shift to online shopping. 
Latin America's online marketplace Mercado Libre, for example, sold twice as many articles per day in the second quarter of 2020 compared with the same period the previous year. An African e-commerce platform Jumia reported a 50% jump in transactions during the first six months of 2020. In China, the online share of retail sales rose from 19.4 to 24.6% between August 2019 and August 2020. In Kazakhstan, the online share of retail sales increased from 5% in 2019 to 9.4% in 2020. In Thailand, downloads of shopping apps jumped 60% in the week between the imposition of partial lockdown and full emergency measures during March. The accelerated trend towards e-commerce seen during the pandemic is likely to be sustained during recovery. More than 50% of those interviewed in Octa's consumer survey in nine countries said that they expected to continue shopping more often online after the pandemic. E-commerce platforms are therefore likely to retain many of the new market shares gained during the pandemic vis-a-vis -vis offline markets. However, in many of the world's least developed countries, consumers and businesses aren't able to capitalize on the new e-commerce opportunities due to persistent bottlenecks and weaknesses in their e-trade readiness. Find out more about the impacts of COVID-19 on e-commerce and digital trade. Download the COVID-19 and e-commerce global review here. Jim Board, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Um, with that, um, please um, let us move right into um, your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how safe is it for e-shoppers to shop online? and to rely on the internet for more news, health-related information, and digital entertainment. So thank you, Walter, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone uh, who is on the call. And um, uh, yes, I will be um, uh, happy to participate in this, uh, this webinar because ANCTAD and the Universal Postal Union uh, go back quite uh, quite a while in terms of collaborating in the area of e-commerce, and it's a great opportunity for us to participate. And you know, we estimate that there are now around 1.5 billion online shoppers in the world, and an increasingly important question for them is how safe is it to engage in online activities? And here, the pattern varies considerably around the world. In many countries are yet to establish comprehensive legal and regulatory frameworks for e-commerce uh, or enacted legislation governing the areas listed. Our cyber law tracker monitors the enactment of relevant legislation in four areas, including consumer protection online. And in December 2020, only just over half of UNCTAD's member states had adopted laws to protect consumers online. If you look at the least developed countries, that share was only 40%, and among small island developing states, it was as low as 24%. Uh, the absence of uh, consumer protection laws, of course, makes customers vulnerable to abuse by unscrupulous traders, particularly in countries where consignment tracking and delivery networks are poorly developed. So is is therefore not surprising that many internet users in developing countries are hesitating to engage in e-commerce. For example, even in the leading digital hubs of Africa, such as Kenya and Nigeria and South Africa, less than 20% of internet users choose to buy something online, but they may be very active on social media. And this can be interpreted as, as a lack of trust in the online space. Uh, we have also seen that confidence in digital payment mechanisms takes time to develop. Uh, you know, in most uh, developing countries, people who do engage in e-commerce, uh, they are still mainly paying through cash on delivery. Although during the COVID crisis, we have seen an uptake in the use of mobile money payments and other digital payments. And there is anxiety about possible fraud that inhibits e-commerce and online payments. 
particularly in countries with inadequate protection. So new users who are unfamiliar with potential risk, they can be particularly vulnerable. Um, let me also add a few points to what we were saying here uh, about the, the risks and so on that, that countries are or consumers are facing. Uh, if you look at the risks attached to digital payments, you would say that they include hackers and scammers, stealing bank account details, social security numbers, and other personal information. Uh, although data theft at the point of transaction is quite difficult, cyber criminal criminals may instead look to access databases that contain credit or debit card information. According to one global survey of IT professionals in August 2020, the most common types of cyber attacks experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic were credential theft, phishing or social engineering, account takeovers, and general malware. E-commerce fraud was already on the increase when the pandemic hit. Another study by TransUnion found that between 2018 and 2019, there, were, uh, there was a 347% increase in account takeovers and a 391% increase in shipping, in phishing fraud attempts globally against its online retail customers. And the number of phishing sites more than trebled between January and the middle of March 2020. And Google has also reported a surge in phishing sites worldwide, reaching a total of more than 2 million by late 2020, more than 19% higher than the year before. So we can also see that the combination of more teleworking, online conferencing, and online commerce is raising security concern. People working from home often have fewer security defenses in their home networks than in their workplaces. Online consumers may also be concerned that products ordered are not up to standards. That is what is received does not correspond to what was actually ordered. And that additional cost may be added, especially if the products are imported from abroad. So in order to boost consumer confidence in e-commerce, countries really need to strengthen the laws and regulations for consumer protection online. And here, there's really a great improvement in many parts of the world, scope for great improvement. Maybe I could just add a little bit to what was said in the video that we, that we just watched here. Um, we, uh, we produced this um, global review together with the other parts of the UN family, the regional commissions, plus a few other E-Trade for all uh, partners. And uh, during the past 12 months or so, we have been engaging in a number of different activities to really try to understand better what it all means for e-commerce, this pandemic that we are all still fighting. Uh, as you saw, there has been a significant upsurge in business to consumer e-commerce, which is, of course, what is the main interest in this discussion that we're having today. And we saw that the retail sales uh, has, uh, the online share of retail sales has gone up quite significantly. And this has been observed in countries at all levels of development, of course, starting from different levels. And um, let me share a few more numbers that we will release next Monday, actually, in, in our new global estimates for, for e-commerce. In the United States, the share of online to total retail sales rose from 11 to 14% in 2020. I'm sorry about that, phone. In the UK, it surged from 16 to 23%, and in Singapore, it doubled from 6 to 12%. Uh, we did last year a, a survey of consumers in nine countries together with Netcom Swiss e-commerce association. We found that half of the people surveyed shopped online more after the pandemic broke out with a similar increase in their other digital activities. In these nine countries, the range of products that attracted the highest level of online shopping changed over the course of the pandemic. We saw pharmaceutical and COVID related health products that were particularly in high demand in the beginning of the pandemic while demand for groceries and other products grew later in response to the lockdowns and other movement restrictions. Delivery services have benefited from this with those focused on food deliveries reported to have more than doubled their business volume in many countries. 
If we look, for instance, at evidence from Brazil and other countries, it shows that there has been a substantial growth in the enrollment for digital entertainment services, especially for music and video streaming, for distance learning, as well as online gaming. We have also seen that the use of digital payment methods has become more widespread since the onset of the pandemic. And maybe that can serve as an introduction to the, the discussion and the debate we will have today. And I thank you so much again for the opportunity, Walter. Back to you. Thank you, Tjernberg. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And before um, we will enter into our panel uh, session, uh, just uh, let me ask you one, one, uh, one question related to ID theft, data theft, illicit trade, product security. Um, what has been uh, the UPU's uh, role in all this? Uh, um, obviously, there's a close collaboration. There had been certain initiatives, um, in particular when it came to the network security um, of, of the UPU. Um, can, you, can you bring your perspective on that? Uh, well, I'm, I must confess I'm not really an expert in what UPU has done in this area, uh, but uh, I can say that uh, uh, we clearly um, have a long uh, you know, journey together with the UPU in looking at the different aspects of e-commerce and development. Um, and what we have done in the past uh, couple of years is that we have engaged in what we call e-trade readiness assessments, where we go out to the, the, the countries that are trailing the furthest behind in this rapidly evolving digital economy. And for instance, we had a very important collaboration with the UPU in certain uh, countries where uh, the governments felt that the postal system has an extremely important role to play on the logistics side, but also in the payments landscape. Um, and I think this is something that we look forward to continuing working with UP on. Uh, and I would say that the, for many of the weaker economies around the world, the postal system may be the only way to reach out to the rural and remote areas that are starting also to engage in e-commerce, although it's still at a very early stage. Yeah, well, thank you very much indeed. Please stay on. Um, we, have, we have further questions for sure for you, uh, Turnborn. And, and, and with that, I'm, I'm moving right um, into our session with our distinguished uh, panelists. And I would like to um, introduce the Uiwa Kumar, he is uh, the policy analyst with uh, CUTS, that's the uh, Customer Unity and Trust Society International. He is a law graduate. He has over 20 years of exposure to trading systems, intellectual property, competition, and regulation. His current focus is the digital economy. He was earlier um, a national consultant on trade and health policy at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Um, we while um, a few large global platform intermediaries are dominating the e-commerce space. They have helped to drive down costs, increase choice and streamline services for consumers. Does this mean consumers are fully protected and able to exercise their consumer rights? And what is the cost to national economies in terms of jobs, income, and innovation? We will, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Uh, this is a very pertinent question, Walter. Uh, uh, the high concentration in uh, platform market uh, is a concern in many economies. Uh, while uh, we consumers may be benefiting at least in Shokna, uh, such market concentration ha can have adverse effect on jobs, income, and also innovation. Uh, and uh, we understand that these uh, big platforms are gatekeepers in the market. Uh, and hence, they are basically de facto regulators. Uh, and in that uh, role as a regulator, de facto regulator, the problem becomes more severe when these platforms adopt dual role. Uh, dual role means uh, they also they provide uh, platform services, but also compete with the business suppliers on their platform. They also are the business suppliers. 
so uh, this is and and this is uh, should be concerned for the postal uh, services as well uh, since many, some of the platforms have their own postal services so whether uh, these platform can ensure platform neutrality is the crux of the is uh, platform neutrality by platform neutrality i mean that uh, these platforms need to uh, ensure non discriminatory treatment uh, for all the suppliers linked to it uh, and the very dual role model the very nature chances of the breach of uh, platform neutrality uh, increases uh, realizing this uh, that uh, the anti trust or competition authorities or competition enforcement may not be sufficient uh, to deal with such a problem uh, uh, many countries are uh, considering platform to business regulations in fact eu is also considering that and it's an advantage to uh, eu digital market act a second issue uh, with uh, increasing uh, concentration and market power is its adverse effect on the very effort to make the economy inclusive uh, as such and uh, uh, and there are many blogs on this imf has come out uh, recently that uh, market power can even uh, increasing market power can even uh, the uh, hurdle in economic recovery so realizing all this uh, initial also in the beginning also this uh, whole issue was uh, uh, flagged to the uh, national governments in many countries so the government or the even the competition authorities are now considering uh, interpreting the consumer welfare uh, uh, widely Uh, you all, we all know that uh, consumer welfare is one of the main main goals of uh, this competition law or competition regime. So uh, initially, uh, uh, the traditionally there has been interpretation that consumer welfare will simply the consumer surplus will, you know, kind of uh, 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 translate into consumer welfare. But looking all the whole uh, effect on economy and and uh, uh, jobs and income, that means uh, shrinking of the consumer base. Uh, 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 the wider uh, uh, interpretation of consumer welfare is being uh, uh, considered by uh, many authorities, and at least uh, 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 discussed in the academic circle in many, many countries. Secondly, also uh, the, we are seeing some changes in the, the the way the market power is being interpreted or the the dominance, uh, uh, so that the abuse of dominance can be established. uh initially this dominance and uh, market power were generally uh, uh construed uh, relying solely on market share approach and we understand that in most uh, e-commerce segment there are two or three players having some market share none of them are dominant and then market tips uh so there is a tendency to to see market power in terms of whether the firm is uh, has the ability to work independent of competition uh, so that that uh, is also changing and, and since there is no uh, uh, concept of collective dominance in most jurisdictions uh, the changes in the the market power interpretation are uh, 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 most welcome in that sense uh, uh, certain authorities are also taking into account the the control over data and the network effect whether the firm has that uh, 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 as one of the elements of market power so yeah, we are really going uh, beyond the uh, market share approach uh, in some some countries there are call for uh, some extreme measures like uh, breaking up uh, big platforms uh, but i am i'm not uh, comfortable with the idea Uh, at this moment of time, I am not yet satisfied that uh, that would be a better option. But in my opinion, there are certain measures that would be useful in this, uh, particularly related with the data regulation, uh, like having data portability, uh, uh, more interoperability of data. Uh, we are seeing in India it's worked very well in the fintech sector, and uh, it may be applied into the retail sector, e-commerce sector. 
that that basically by this uh, 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 a new entrant new platform entrant will, will be able to achieve the critical mass of network effect easily and uh, if they have access to capital uh, uh, they can be a competitor and they can uh, challenge this concentration so uh, i think but uh, above all i think the whole of government approach would be needed rather than uh, to solely leave it on competition of parties or consumer protection of parties uh, i should stop here Great. Well, thank you very much for your uh, first um, input here. Um, with that, um, I would like to uh, to move on uh, to Liz Cole. Um, she is a consumer policy analyst and expert on consumer behavior in the digital age, specializing in the impact of connected digital technology uh, on markets, consumers and regulation. She currently leads uh, Consumers International's digital advocacy strategy. Um, as a world-class expert on consumer tech policy, data protection, and online consumer protection, Liz, what have we learned during the COVID-19 pandemic about how consumers can benefit from e-commerce? Liz, please. Thanks, Walter. And uh, thanks to UPU for inviting me to participate. Um, I think the main thing the main benefit we've we've learned about again is access, um, whether that's to the essentials of health, food, care, equipment, um, right through to the other things that made lives easier during the lockdown, with clothes and luxuries like books and leisure, things like that. Um, and it it's it emphasised again the benefits of e-commerce providing this range of products and a range of different suppliers and goods, um, which also means consumers can get perhaps specialist items or replacement parts, which they wouldn't have been able to get before. Um, we know obviously that more people, well over half of the people in the UNCTAD and NetSuite surveys reported spending more time shopping and looking for information and entertainment online. So that's clear, but these things have always been beneficial. I think what's significant here is that during the various national lockdowns, they, they became more like lifelines for people. So this is really important, a really important moment for e-commerce because it's shifting in nature in some ways to almost an essential service. Um, so if predictions play out, and I th I'm not sure that we'll see this permanent shift, to huge shift to online shopping, we don't know yet. People may be reporting that they will carry on online or or they may, um, you know, their intentions may not play out. We don't know yet, but we're certainly likely, particularly in more mature e-commerce markets, for there just to be less physical shops to visit. So there, I think inevitably there'll be a rise in online, online shopping and it will remain essential for, for goods and services. Or it may be that there are particular types of goods and services like, <laughs> like electrical um, equipment that will become very rare on in physical stores and e-commerce will become the core delivery for them. So, but so I think because e-commerce is likely to become more of an essential lifeline service, it does need more attention and protection. Um, we've also seen that more lower income consumers have been accessing online markets. So, and, and the UNCTAD report shows that people were buying essentials more frequently, although spending lower amounts. Um, again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's completely affordable or that people had full trust. It could have been more that it was the only the option there. But it does mean it's opened up that mark, a, a market of consumers for people to pay attention to and to look at those vital issues of payments and delivery options um, that, that need attention. Um, I think the other benefits is that uh, what we've learned through the lockdown about the benefits is how adaptable um, online shopping can be. So it, it was, it, there was a few delays at the beginning, but I think overall um, our, it was able to react well and deliver goods to people safely with minimal contact. Um, so it was able to, to adapt its services to that contactless um, environment. And that kept, obviously kept people out of the busy shops and physical contact. Um, so we're seeing its ability to innovate um, Obviously, platforms are largely tech driven, so they've got a, 
a culture of continuing to innovate. And I think we'll see more of those innovations in payments and deliveries um, speeding up as we have done during the pandemic. Um, so we can see that there, there's lots of um, benefits which may hopefully be able to be adapted to communities who have so far maybe more financially vulnerable or who've not have access. Um, I suppose the final thing I'd say is a little bit of caution. So even with all these positives and increase in activity, we need to maybe not get carried away. The high use doesn't mean there's been no problems. Um, it, it's people had in a way had to use these services as their only options. So we should celebrate that there's been greater access and use, but I think we need to pay attention to um, some of the long-standing issues that are already there and need solving. Thank you, Liz. Uh, this has been very helpful and very insight. Um, very important for the UPU, of course, because uh, according to recent studies, the UPU is the backbone um, of, uh, of e-commerce commercial delivery with about 70% of all e-commerce items in the networks of the designated operator constituting now of course the global postal network and with that I would like to to go back to Tor Björn um, and um, and ask him uh, another important question we believe policymakers have been discussing the importance uh, of consumer trust in e-commerce for many years but it is still a factor that inhibits adoption what is holding countries back from addressing the issues like payment security, data protection, delivery fulfillment that will help reassure trust? What are specific issues for the least developed countries? Torbjörn, please. Thank you, Walter. Um, so I think for many countries, a key challenge is the lack of a coherent strategy for fostering e-commerce. That really represents a key bottleneck. Uh, the challenge that many governments and countries are facing in the area of e-commerce is that it is so cross-cutting in nature and it involves, involves many different ministries, many agencies uh, of the government. And therefore it's very important for countries to establish some form of mechanism for approaching e-commerce and the digital economy more broadly in a more holistic way under a whole of government approach. It's very difficult just to focus on improving the internet connectivity, for instance, if you don't also address all the other factors that influence whether e-commerce and the e-commerce ecosystem will work. Uh, we're also seeing a need to establish better mechanisms for facilitating multi-stakeholder dialogue here. Really, and it's not just between the private sector and the government, but also finding ways to involve the civil society and the, the consumer dimension of, of uh, e-commerce. Uh, most developing countries lack clear structure for engaging, structures for engaging with consumer organizations, as well as the ICT sector, possibly beyond the telecom operator. Uh, given the complexity of digitalization, good multi-stakeholder dialogue in this area is really essential to help the government in adopting the right, uh, adapting and adopting the right responses. Uh, finally, I think the international community has a very important role to play. We need to do much more to support, especially those countries, and you mentioned the least developed countries here, that are trailing the furthest behind in the digital economy. Uh, we must provide more assistance in terms of how to formulate strategies, how to develop better mechanisms for the dialogue that I was referring to, how to develop better legal and regulatory frameworks, strengthening institutions, collecting better statistics, and fostering better infrastructure for ICT, trade logistics, and payment solutions. ANCTAD, UPU, and other international organizations can make very important contributions to this end and also fostering at our level, good interaction between us and the other stakeholders in the market. Thank you very much. Um, I have the feeling this is just the beginning of a, a, long, a long road, um, but I think um, it is very important to listen um, to the input uh, of our speakers and panelists. So let me turn back to, to Liz again. Um, asking her what should countries with lower levels of e-commerce readiness focus on as they develop their e-commerce infrastructure on 
the other hand, what has not worked so well for customers and what challenges have been highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic for online consumers? Liz, the floor is yours. Thanks, Walter. Um, so I think that along with the things that Torbjorn has mentioned, I think I feel there's important lessons in what not to do, <laughs> which we can learn from um, the more mature e-commerce markets. Because as I said before, some of these problems have been here since e-commerce became mainstream. So whether that's the lack of clear information about um, terms and con about products, about your rights, difficulty in reading all the long terms and conditions, misleading adverts, um, fake reviews. There's all sorts of things that are there which are not working brilliantly at the moment. So while on the one hand, yes, there, there's lots about the infrastructure and delivery um, that, that you can that you can um, learn from successful e-commerce environments, I think there's an awful lot about what's not going well. Um, which would be great for countries developing their e-commerce readiness to build in right from the beginning. Um, and some of those things um, are the sort of systemic things that, that the other panellists have mentioned um, and things around when you have online marketplaces, who is monitoring and policing um, the sellers. Um, there's always been um, unsafe goods on sale, poor quality or counterfeit goods goods that are actually banned in offline markets, you can easily find again online. Um, and throughout the pandemic, we saw again, um, things like poor practice from the sellers, like price gouging and things like that. So there's some systemic problems which are there, which which nobody's really um, satisfactorily addressing at the moment. So I would also think about how you can build in those issues when, when, you're, when you're looking at building up e-commerce readiness. Alongside those things, the, the more well-known things around data security, um, delivery and, um, and, and getting redress and things like that. I think there's also quite an interesting context at the moment created by the pandemic, um, but also following other trends. So we've got more people buying more and a bigger range of things online. We've got a lot of inexperienced consumers coming to online shopping as for the first time. And this is really important because if you've done it gradually and been an online shopper for a while, you've maybe got wise to some of the, the, the risks and the pitfalls. You sort of have some shortcuts to check and to keep yourself, well, to minimize your risks to a degree. If you're coming into an online market for the first time, some of them are quite sophisticated. There's lots of different things you need to be looking out for. So there's a big, I think, a big um, skills and capacity building, not just in how you use digital, but how to keep yourself safe and how to use it confidently. And also on, part of the, on the part of the providers to make information easy to digest and understand. Um, so that's one part of the context, a lot more people, some of them inexperienced. We've also got this mix of models and channels. So we've got the marketplace, platform models that Yuzhua talked about. We've got direct online retailers. Um, we've got offline retailers who are using separate e-commerce platforms um, to help with delivery and logistics. We've got delivery systems, advertising systems. There's a big mix in there. Um, and it's only going to get more complex and blended as, as we go on. Um, so I think, again, in term, that all of that creates a bit of a lack of clarity about, about where the different obligations sit and where responsibilities sit. A fair amount of it's happening across borders. So I think it, when, you're, um, when you're thinking about what countries of those lower levels should focus on, they, they need to look at the, start from the consumer and look at the world that they're entering into. Um, and they won't, consumers aren't necessarily thinking whether they're buying consumer to consumer or business to consumer. Are they using the platform model or directly? That's, they're not policy makers. They don't think in those terms, but that's the market they'll be experiencing. So I think there needs to be a real understanding about how people are buying um, and what they need to make that secure and risk-free. Thank you. Thank you for this, uh, Liz. Um, 
I would like to move um, back to Ui Wao um, and asking him, cross-border e-commerce fell during COVID-19. What are the challenges in uh, rebuilding cross-border e-commerce, in particular, of course, with a clear focus um, on, on your region, but uh, I, I'm sure you have, you have a clear insight there. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. Again, a uh, very important question. Uh, Tobin has discussed uh, the, the crux of this, why it is not there. I mean, as it is, uh, the, the share of B2C e-commerce in cross-border has been very low. And that was basically because of the lack of consumer trust. Lack of consumer trust, first and foremost thing is uh, uh, the, the cross-border dispute settlement of consumer issues. Uh, uh, who should have the jurisdiction? Uh, if there is a consumer dispute, where would I go? Uh, uh, how it will be implemented? Uh, these are the issues that, that these are still unsettled. And I, I learned that uh, the, the ongoing WTO uh, uh, at the negotiations are taking up this issue. And perhaps there will be a chapter on uh, e-commerce uh, consumer protection, cross-border consumer protection. Either there, there will be a uh, 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 of, on a coordination model uh, that all the consumer authorities will coordinate or there may be certain uh, minimum standards that uh, every country has to follow as far as consumer protection is concerned. Then uh, again, Tobin said about uh, the, the lack of data protection regimes, uh, particularly the cyber security aspect uh, 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 and, and the consumers in developing countries are largely uh, not much uh, uh, bother about their personal data, but they are very wary about the, the bank frauds that has, that are happening and which is which has increased in the pandemic as such. And uh, uh, third uh, issue in the trust consumer trust umbrella is the 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 counterfeiting uh, of products, uh, uh, which also a consumer feels that whether uh, goods will be genuine or not. Uh, if I, I, and, and whether the goods uh, which has been uh, shown in the picture will uh, match the match when 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 I get the, the goods. Uh, another hurdle uh, is apart. Uh, another hurdle for uh, uh, lack of B two C cross border e commerce has been uh, protectionist uh, tendencies that uh, countries have uh, of late, uh, which has got. Uh, 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 fueled by this pandemic lockdown, uh, when the countries have realized that they are they are, have to be more uh, self-reliant uh, on this, and, and pandemic has also broken the, the global supply chain, uh, which gave uh, country to an opportunity to be uh, self-reliant, uh, at least in essential goods and services. Uh, one aspect of uh, 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 protectionism is also uh, uh, the regulation of data. Uh, 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 most countries are uh, uh, of the view that uh, restricting the cross-border flow of data will uh, help them, uh, or, or, or you can say data localization, uh, they will, they, they, it will help them in creating national champions, which will be globally competitive. As Tobin has rightly pointed out that, and, and another Antarctic study has pointed out that the, the values the gains from the digital economy, the value addition, uh, is largely going to countries, and that is China and USA, uh, uh, to the tune of 90% goes to the two countries. So, uh, and, they, uh, and uh, the countries understand that these two countries are the ones who, who are controlling the digital ecosystem. So, to control the digital ecosystem, one, one will have to have a national champion. Uh, globally competitive national champion will be a kind of uh, conglomerates. Uh, and, and this thought process has uh, uh, get into a large country like India, which are uh, kind of putting uh, restrictions on cross-border flow of data. So these are the protectionist issues that, that, that can come uh, in a way of uh, uh, as a hurdle in the B2C uh, uh, cross-border e-commerce. I hope that uh, country who realize that uh, e-commerce is a very good mode for exports, particularly for its uh, small uh, scale businesses, 
because uh, they may not have that uh, uh, resources to uh, export uh, like a big exporter. So they can use the platform logistic to export without uh, investing much. So I hope the country will realize and, and, and will have a focus on e-commerce in their trade facilitation policies. Uh, India is looking into uh, in the, in the new trade uh, uh, policy. It will have a chapter in e-commerce. So uh, I think countries are realizing, but there are pros and cons so how to deal with that, uh, some clarity are developing. Thank you very much indeed. Um, um, I see. Uh, I see that we're starting to be rather lively already in the chat. But before I turn to those those questions, I would like to pick up um, these uh, these comments already. Uh, and back to you, um, Uyval. Um, of course, I mean um, a country like like India is very much based on small and medium sized enterprises. I think it's therefore very important to help those businesses to onboard, to become um, digital commercial um, entities. Um, what would you uh, advise uh, for, those, for those companies be, in, in particular, to, to best serve their customers? I think this is now imperative that uh, uh, the small businesses uh, digitalize themselves. Is, even, I think, to survive in the market, they have to do. Uh, and uh, uh, how to onboard uh, in countries like India is a, is a very big challenge. First challenge is uh, the digital divide. There may be a vast number of small players who are on the other side of the digital divide who may not come. Secondly, those who are in the in, in have access to internet and have access to that may not be trained enough to. Uh, on board and, and do business, how to do businesses on, uh, on digital platforms. There are training programs, uh, so the UN agencies are doing such training programs uh, to focusing on the MSMEs to train them to come on the on board. Uh, thirdly, I would say the trust issue of cybersecurity also comes with the MSMEs as well. Uh, their impersonation, somebody else can impersonate them on the platform and supply certain goods and, and, and the liability will be passed on them. Uh, their, their bank accounts may be hacked. So these are the concerns unless we we, we train them beautifully and, 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 and we have that robust uh, cyber security framework in a country. Uh, uh, things may be difficult, but uh, I think uh, government is also very keen. Government of India is also very keen to uh, uh, onboard uh, e-commerce platform. Uh, sorry, onboard uh, MSMEs. They have on. Government of India has a platform, uh, its own platform, uh, whereby it's procured uh, through MSMEs, uh, which is called as government e-market. They are now thinking to uh, expand it to, this is basically at this moment of time, it is uh, business to government, B2G. So they are trying to uh, see if it is feasible to turn that uh, platform to B2C as well. And, and in that process, uh, the, uh, the India Post, the, the post office, uh, the, the postal department of India is very much into that. Uh, they want to develop an ecosystem where India Post also plays a uh, role because it has reached to the every nook and corner of the India. Yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, but it is a difficult task, and but it is happening. It is happening. It is yeah. happening. Slowly and slowly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I also see um, a question in the chat coming from Singapore, um, asking that uh, with uh, uh, the shift in cross-border postal volumes to more commercial B2B channels instead uh, to B2C channels, um, is that just an effect on the collapse of air freight or um, is that uh, a tendency to stay um, or will B2C be the most dominant channel there? Perhaps a question to you, uh, Liz. Um, could you give us your insight there? Um, sorry, on the on the B two B question. 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I don't, I wonder whether we're a bit premature in talking about the collapse of uh, cross-border business to consumer e-commerce. I think with lots of these patterns that we're seeing through um, the pandemic, it's not entirely clear yet which ones are there to stay. I mean, I, I ha- if, if you look, if, if you like, um, if you look positively at the, the local economy, local business story, there certainly does seem to be a sense that people want to be supporting um, their local businesses and services or national services. Um, and and a very can very clearly see the link between, um, y- you know, um, it, the, the link between the local community and, and the job creation and income creation. Um, but I don't, it, it's difficult to say how long that will last if we're heading into, you know, large recessions and, and drops in income, um, whether that, uh, you know, local national picture will continue or whether actually people will just be going back to look for the, the most um, economic option. Um, but in terms of, so in terms of the postal volumes, I, I, I'm probably, possibly a bit too early to say, I don't know um, if any other panellists had, had an opinion on that as well. Oh, Bjorn, yes, I'm counting on you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, frankly, I mean, UPU is probably the best place to, to respond to the postal volumes here, but, but maybe just to, to uh, uh, get a perspective on, the, on what we're talking about here. Uh, when, when we estimate the, the amount of business to consumer e-commerce that is uh, taking place around the world, we see that only about 10% of global B2C e-commerce is cross-border. And most of the cross-border uh, e-commerce is still in the neighboring region. So mm-hmm. like within the EU or uh, in, the, in Canada, it'll be with the US and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think... Uh, I agree with Liz that it's too too early to tell exactly how this will play out after the pandemic, but I, it's clear that uh, um, most of the people that we uh, consulted with think that the, the shift in behavior that we have seen during the pandemic will have lasting effects. But of course, not you don't know exactly how that will play out uh, in the coming years. Uh, but the fact that we are still in the middle of the pandemic uh, and uh, that people have had even more time to adapt to this new situation uh, speaks in favor of, of longer lasting impacts, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also that when it comes to the cross-border dimension, uh, when trade in general picks up and starts growing again, which is, has already started in, in some, some respects, it will also have a favorable effect on cross-border uh, e- e-commerce. Um, I, I, I think one of the interesting findings that we saw in Latin America, for instance, was that and the postal deliveries cross-border uh, were more badly affected than cross-border deliveries that were relying on the private courier companies, which often had their own air fleets, uh, whereas the, the postal system was relying more on the passenger aircraft system for their deliveries. So, so I think this is something that, uh, that has played out very strongly in, in, the, in some parts of the world, at least. And uh, I would actually be very interested to hear the UPU perspective on these issues as well. Yeah, uh, Tom Bjorn, I'm, I'm checking online the current dates uh, <laughs> as you speak. Um, um, unfortunately, I can report a little bit on the tracked parcel network uh, where the UPU, of course, has real time information. And uh, this is very well reflected um, in, in the online data. Um, uh, the UPU network has suffered. Uh, um, uh, around uh, around 25 to 30 percent of the volume compared to uh, the year without uh, COVID is missing in the global network cross border. Yeah, um, so so there uh, has been um, quite a strong um, impact uh, on the global postal network. Um, and you're absolutely right. The UPU has has undertaken severe action to re-establish, in particular. Uh, the necessary backbone when it came to air transport. Um, um, Of course, we all know that uh, air traffic, um, in particular passenger planes, were hit the most, and most of the postal items were onboarded onto those planes. Um, However, uh, the UPU, and in particular, of course, the International Bureau, and uh, we have to give credit uh, to to the UPU here, did their utmost to re-establish 
um, a highly secure and functioning network there. Um, so a lot of work has been done. Uh, you know, of course, that uh, the negotiations with um, I IATA um, and also the newly established uh, um, air freight um, uh, association here uh, has been very in instrumental um, uh, of bringing this secure network back into action. Um, so um, let me let me look into the uh, the uh, the chat. Um, any further questions um, for our uh, from our from our audience? Um, currently, I see none. So uh, yes, um, we are coming to the end of, of this trilogy, and I would very much like uh, to to thank our speakers, our distinguished keynote presenter, of course. Um, our panelists, and also thank you for the questions in, in the chat. Um, uh, if there are any further questions not answered or coming in later, we of course will share that with the panelists uh, so that we can provide the necessary answers to all of your questions. Uh, please kindly then share your email address so that we can answer them. Um, Thank you very much for your highly insightful presentations today and contributions uh, to this, this webinar. This has been the second of three webinars hosted by the Consultative Committee of the Universal Postal Union on the various aspects of e-commerce. The third webinar is scheduled for the 19th of May and uh, will be focusing on redefining the universal service obligation in the changing digital postal environment, as we heard today already several times, that delivery is an essential service for the execution of e-commerce, but any other postal service. It is very close to our ongoing universal service obligation refinement that needs to happen during this time of digitalization. It again will be hosted between 11 and 12 o'clock, and uh, with that, I would very much like to thank you for participating, and I'm looking forward to your participation at the upcoming third webinar. Thank you very much indeed, um, and all the best to you. Please stay healthy in this very difficult times. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.